Sustainability works. You know, it can be done. It's not just a dream. We're here, we're doing it. It's a surprise, literally tucked away in the village of Hockerton, a row of five houses that could be a model for a more communal, sustainable lifestyle. The aim was to produce a small settlement of houses um, would have minimal impact, um, both visually and environmentally, on the surrounding area. The project is the brainchild of Nick Martin, the builder for Brenda and Robert Vale's autonomous house in nearby Southall. As soon as I saw the plans for their house in Southall, I knew that they were going to be the people who were going to design these houses. Really, it was a big leap between having some heating and having no heating, and I think probably at the time, the Vales were probably the only people to have really um, seriously made that leap. So how do you keep a house warm with no artificial heating? The Hockerton project offers some imaginative and surprisingly low-tech solutions. Take the earth-sheltered design of the houses, which offers insulation with a difference. The main purpose of the earth on the back is to provide a moderating influence to the inside temperature. Now the earth temperature itself will vary at the upper part between 5 and 15 degrees, uh, summer and winter, and in the lower part towards the bottom of the building will be a constant 10 degrees. Um, that means that the external fabric of the building has actually got this very stable environment of only 10 degrees difference uh, throughout the year and will never see freezing. This represents the roof that's immediately above the living area that's a concrete block um, over this there will be a skim of reinforced concrete just to hold the whole thing together uh, once that's down we place on top of that our insulation which is here polystyrene um, and then once the insulation's down we put our waterproof membrane over the top of that so the waterproof membrane prevents water going down through to the houses. The insulation is preventing heat loss from the houses to, um, to the surface. And on top of this membrane, we actually have the earth covering here, which in reality is about 500 mil deep. Uh, and this moderates the temperature of the whole house um, because the temperature of the earth remains reasonably constant throughout the year. The south facing conservatory provides passive solar gain. Together with the porch, it also acts as a buffer zone, preventing warm air inside the houses from escaping. Since the houses don't use complex technology, they're relatively easy to manage. There's actually very little technology in the house. There's two bits of equipment. There's a heat recovery unit, ventilation unit, and what that does, it provides whole house ventilation but it recovers most of the heat before it exits and pre-warms the incoming air. And the other is a heat pump which we use to transfer the heat from the conservatory to heat our hot water. The hot air that collects in the apex of the conservatory uh, we use to uh, augment the functioning of the heat pump so it works at the most efficiently at, at any one time. The energy to heat the houses comes from the sun, human body heat and any incidental gains from electrical appliances. The concrete construction allows the houses to act like giant storage heaters, storing and releasing heat as required. On a day like this, we've got temperatures of just above zero outside, but it's a sunny day and it's heated up to the conservatory to over 25 degrees. What we do is we'll open up the doors and windows from the main part of the house out into the conservatory, bring that heat in, and that's collected by the thermal mass of the house, and that will be reused over the next few days. On a cloudy day, we would keep the doors and windows closed, and uh, our incidental gains from our own body heat and the appliances is almost enough to offset any losses. Thank you. 
Super insulation minimizes any heat loss from the houses. The choice of materials has also been made with an eye for the environment. To make best use of their orientation, the houses are designed so that rooms needing light are towards the front, near the conservatory, while study areas and bathrooms are towards the back. The layout is very modular, um, and so you end up with a very long corridor running down the centre of the house. And I, if I was to design it from scratch, um, I think I'd look for a way of having a more central space with rooms coming off around it. Um, but I think that's a really quite a minor point. What's nice about the house is that it's very spacious, it's very light, um, it's very warm when you want it to be warm and cool when you want it to be cool. There's lots of space for the children and it functions really well. It does what it's supposed to do. It really does fit our needs. The tiles actually add to the uh, thermal mass of the construction, which is uh, the important way in which the house um, keeps itself warm. We don't need carpets. Indeed, they would actually reduce the effectiveness in the way in which the house operates. We do find that sound travels through the house um, quite a lot, so you can usually hear what's going on in other rooms, which sometimes is quite useful. <laughs> when you've got children, um, and sometimes it's not. It could well be because of the hard surfaces. Um, we don't have carpets on the floor. Um, the ceilings are high and they're made of concrete, um, so it might well be that. With no heating bills, the main energy consumption comes from electrical water heating and use of appliances. We're using at the moment between eight and 10 kilowatt hours per day. And if we compare that to what we used to use in terms of all our energy costs, including gas as well, then it's somewhere close to 10 to 15% of our original energy consumption. Electricity for Hockerton is currently supplied from the national grid. But in 1999, the project was at last given permission to install a wind turbine. What we want to do is supply all our uh, electrical energy needs from uh, renewable sources and really that's important to us to complete the circle of sustainability and that will supply us enough energy over the year uh, for, for all the houses. That final piece of the jigsaw will make Hockerton largely independent of main supplies since they already collect and treat their own rainwater. Rain from the roof of the conservatories is stored in tanks, filtered and pumped to the houses for drinking. Rainwater runoff from the road and surrounding fields is collected in a small reservoir and used for bathing. Conserving water ensures there's no shortage. We've got some water-efficient devices in the houses. The low-flush toilets, um, which have a dual flush, so you can have uh, one and a half or three litres per flush. And the other one is um, excluding soap from the washing machines by using these wash balls. So if you don't put soap in, um, you don't have to do so much rinsing to get it out, and that can save me 40 litres of wash. The families manage and treat much of their own waste on site. Organic waste is used for compost.
After the solids have settled out in a septic tank, liquid waste from the house is treated in a floating reed bed system. Uh, the floating reed bed works by uh, treating the sewage with the bacteria that live on the roots of the reeds. So we're using a naturally occurring uh, ecosystem to treat the, the sewage. By having several different types of reeds, you can manage to treat the whole spectrum of uh, things in the sewage. Uh, we're using the lake uh, for uh, not just as part of the sewage system, but also because of its position, it helps keep the houses warm, reflecting light into the houses. It's also part of the economic side of the sustainability because uh, we're hoping to use it to uh, farm fish. It's a kind of a, a wonderful facility for the houses. For sustainable living, transport issues can't be ignored. One of the um, conditions of the leases on the house is that each family can only have one fossil fuel car. Um, and even then, uh, you question each journey that you make in that fossil fuel car. Does it have to be done at all? Um, could you do it in another way? Could you cycle in? Could you get public transport? Could you share transport with somebody else? Though two car families are out, multi-cycle families are in. Car sharing is also an option. We uh, actually share a car with our neighbours um, and so although that means you have to organise it and say when you want to go and so on, which is the downside and the challenging bit, it also gives you a very positive uh, social side because it means you have to talk together and arrange things and, and get on. So it has its ups and its downs. Right, here we go then. Bye Trudy. Bye then. Before I joined the project, I spent a lot of the time on the North Circular and travelling around the UK and travelling abroad. Um, I now spend most of my income earning time actually here, just a couple of hundred yards away uh, at most. I used to spend about three hours uh, in dead time travelling. I can get to work in, in one minute or ten seconds if I jump on a bike. Each household has to commit itself to the project for 16 hours a week. It's needed to manage the site in a sustainable way. One of the things we're very conscious about are food miles um, and what it has taken to bring that food to your table. Um, that's why we grow as much as we possibly can. Um, but we're not self-sufficient yet, and so we do have to buy food um, from the shop. But when we buy that, we're very discerning about where it's come from and, you know, what's gone into actually producing that food. If you've got friends around for dinner and you go up to the allotment, the only thing you can find to eat is a green cabbage, and you know, <laughs> you know that's not going to go very far. There's not a lot you can do with it. Um, so you find yourself going into the shop and buying things which are perhaps imported or certainly out of season. Um, and, and that feels, you know, slightly wrong. There are also the practical challenges of living out a shared vision. Making a consensus decision takes a lot longer than um, going for something which, you know, only involves yourself. And that communication process takes effort. If one particular individual, uh, let's say, isn't quite so disciplined about it, um, that can create a bit of friction. If you're working very hard to sort of meet some fairly strict criteria, there has to be a certain amount of uh, allowance for compromise and understanding. 
I think the thing about Hockerton is that the, the lifestyle encompasses so many different aspects of sustainability. We have to think about how we manage the 26 acre site in an environmentally friendly way. We have to think about how we grow enough food for the five families. We also have to think about trying to derive an income um, from the project which will cover everybody's needs. And I think the fact that it's so broad means that there's always a lot to do. But for the families at Hockerton, the advantages far outweigh the effort required. It's, it's not about uh, huge self-sacrifice necessarily. It's not about sandals and, and uh, only allowed to eat beans and, and so on. Um, what it is about is, is making definite choices um, uh, about uh, having a less of a negative footprint on, on the earth and it, it's it, at times it is harder work to actually find those alternatives but when you find them it's not necessarily uh, a greater hardship The Hockerton Housing Project uh, is, is a physical representation um, of all aspects of sustainable development. They operate as a social cohesive unit. This is not everyone's cup of tea. But the value of Hockerton is, is a clear demonstration of what can be achieved if people are of a mind to do it. It's 80% cultural and 20% technical. We don't need huge amounts of innovation and research. They're there. What we need is a change of thinking in, in terms of politics and culture. And as always, those are the biggest challenges. <laughs>